and welcome to Unscrupulous, the podcast where we talk dishonest folks whose victims always live to tell the tale. Welcome to my good friend, Adam Lawler. Hello, and hello to my good friend, Beck Rose. Aww. How are you? I'm just so excited. How are you? I am nervous and very excited at the same time. Perfect. This is, We're on the same page. Yeah. This is wild. This is We've talked about this for a little bit. We have, yeah. I think we both wanted to do podcasts and then we're like wait why have we never talked about doing a podcast together that is very true let's just keep like, dreaming about it sadly yeah, let's keep doing it separately because as as a, a white man i'm like i can't possibly do a podcast on my own you know what? i feel that also where i'm like is our voice like it's a saturated market is our voice really yeah. that different but you know what i believe it is <laughs> bold, bold right out of the gate Coming in hot, right out of, we have a place here i think also i like it like so our whole niche is of course that we're going to be talking crimes where people aren't murdered there's not going to be gruesome crime scenes uh and you don't really see a lot of that yeah there's not a ton there's a lot i think it's kind of slowly starting to change but it's still the 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 money maker the money. of true crime is murder <laughs> it's just all the all the gore it is it is a crowd favorite um yeah yeah i i can't lie i mean that that's definitely what got me in to true crime um oh yes for sure i actually don't know if i've ever asked you what got you into true crime what your first thing was my first thing like my first like absolute rabbit hole obsession when I was way too young to do it was um, Jack the Ripper. Classic. Jack T. Ripper. The Ripster. The Ripper. <laughs> and we're not talking farts. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's how I'm going to start my officially uh, published book. On, on <laughs> Does something smell? Jack T. Ripster, colon, not talking about farts. Um. Yeah, I was I, I was in elementary school and there was uh it was like a it was a case file. Yeah, it, it was it was a website called like Case File or something like that and it just had like all of the details, all of the police reports, all of the autopsy photos, all of the witness statements. Like it was just tons. Perfect. It was all in there and yeah, and I started Here's how you can tell I was too young to do it. It's not because of the violence, but it was because like I spent like 20 minutes on there at first and I was like definitely like oh yeah, I think I solved it. <laughs> you like, know what? Done. They didn't it's know. Done. They just needed to ask this young child. They needed from time small town Ontario. and me. <laughs> and me. <laughs> I like that 2 minutes ago you're like as a white man is my voice 2 seconds later. <laughs> You know what they're missing? I'm over it now. As as soon as it became the official I did, recording, yeah, I was I'm like, sure. oh, I feel my powers. There is something about, like, the, when you find the, like, creepy thing and you can feel, like, the top part of your brain searing off as you're like, why am I so fascinated by this? Like, yes. why can I not stop thinking about anything else? And it feels weird. And I don't want to tell people that, like, I found this thing. Mm -hmm. But I will not stop thinking about it until the day I die. Yes. And I think I used to also, when I was super young, like specifically seek out um, things that I, things that I knew would scare me. Mm -hmm. And like, there, there were certain books with like, with like illustrations or pictures. And I'd be like, I'd look at them and then like close them and throw them in the closet and be like, oh, I can't ever look at those again. I mean, and then I would just like two weeks would go by and I'd be like, I have to, <laughs> I have to look at the, at the, the, or the famous picture of the leg from the spontaneous combustion oh, in yeah. like the sixties where it's just the leg in a pile of ash and it's just this creepy black and white photo. Yeah. And it freaked me out to no end, but I would just stare at that picture. It was wild. I feel like you still do that now, as you've lent me a graphic novel or two. <laughs> that I'm like, I... Jesus, <laughs> I can only read this in the safety of my home. I absolutely do do that now. Although I have gotten much better at um, recognizing my mental state. <laughs> and being like, is this hard? Oh, this is a spiral. Yeah. I will not... Yeah. keep going or i i can't look at this right now i can't consume this 
story or or whatever i've i've become much better at that but there are times when i'm like shut up brain <laughs> we're gonna go full <laughs> tilt i've done it's that. me time i've gone with like uh subreddits where i'm like oh yeah i'm totally into like um crime photo subreddit two photos in i like closed it and <laughs> like warned everyone i knew like don't go there you're not ready <laughs> You can't, you can't pop. You can't unsee. Like I actively had to practice blocking parts out of it from my brain because I'm like, but it's yeah. with that like certain um, stories too, like like the toy box killer. That's one that I'm like, I don't even want to talk about it. Like those details. Ugh. Yeah, I can't do that. I can't. I can't really do Dean Coral. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Candyman. He that story messes me up. I just up. think I don't, of like, the the last podcast voice renditions when I think of like who is that? Oh yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> them talking Dean Coral. Now I remember Henry's interpretation of that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I I toys and yeah, candy. There are, who I, thought I, don't toys mix. and candy? I remember like specifically if I would talk about stuff in public, in public, um. I would like get really excited and mention all these things and then immediately be like, don't Google that name. Like, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to see a lot of shit that I've seen and you don't need to see that. I've, I've taken that for you. I've taken like, it. Yeah. But, but it's yeah. also at that party where you're looking for the person who goes Dean Coral and you're like, hello friend for life. Yes. Which I feel like is how we became friends. Of it's being very like, true. Oh, I just made a really dark joke, and you're the in a room of shocked people. Adam's in the corner laughing. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, it's a good I time. Do too. And what was? Do you remember what your first obsession was? I d- viscerally remember. Um, okay. That you know, I say that, and then I'm like, it, I feel like I like creepy things at a young age. I watched the mummy in like third grade and became obsessed with like mummification and stuff oh my god knowing all the details was my fucking yeah. jam i mean this is oh yeah you just shove that poker right up there scramble that was up mine the brains too. but you know what this is also now that i'm older i've realized this is just neurodivergency <laughs> but um uh the the crime that got me into it i liked it also on this non-murdery true crime podcast we're talking murder right at the gate but this will be like the yeah. only time um, we open it up yeah i should have said like jonestown just to get the number in there just... <laughs> <laughs> it was flavor raid um <laughs> mine was john wayne gacy mm, okay. an early sign that i was super gay um because he's gay that's the joke everybody so <laughs> uh yeah i remember listening to the musician Sukan Stevens and mm-hmm. he has a song called John Wayne Gacy Jr. and I was a melancholy teen and I loved that song and then I was listening to the words and I don't know what led me to google it I feel like I was googling Sufian and it led me to being like oh there's like a a link to this other name and then reading about <laughs> clownery and murder and me being like uh yes there's a new part of my brain that is real hot and happy right now yes it yeah. hath been activated <laughs> yes <laughs> morbidity <laughs> engaged uh but i am feeling as i get older i think a lot of people are getting away from like at least in our friend group i know like like emily your wife and i we would always watch true crime stuff and talk about it and now when i do she's like she was specifically like it can't be murder yes and that was when i started to be like oh yeah it does make me scared and sad (laughs) yeah and like i don't know whether but i still need my true crime itch scratched yes i need something that is like Something that is at least a tiny bit unexplainable yeah. or like for like just so unfathomable to my mind, even if it's the tiniest detail mm-hmm. in a story. And like, it doesn't even have to be. It's it's not like law. 
It's not anything like that. It's not Law and Order. <laughs> no. It's not like so. It's not support for the fucking police. I was gonna say these are two millennials who like want to burn it to the ground. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, we're over it. Yeah. It's uh, a it hasn't worked, so let's do it different. On, yeah, on definitely. And I I cannot. Yeah, I I think it's just that that thing that I've always had, even when I was a kid of. Um, it, I would take stock of a moment and like think to myself, what is like just top of your mind something real that could happen right now that is like the worst possible thing or the creepiest thing? Uh, intrusive thoughts. Yes, I'm familiar. <laughs> yes, when you then you you graduate from uh, mental illness academy, <laughs> they were like, here you go. That's what it was. <laughs> um and i i still i'll i'll catch myself doing it but it's it's that yeah it's that little bit of like i cannot i just can't extend myself enough to understand the actions mm-hmm. of some of the people involved in the stories and i think that's what really kind of connects me to true crime now yeah it's like the human like the anthropological element yeah yeah That's it's even like the right type of logical to have picked in that i don't know it sounded good thank you it's recorded I, now uh, so it has to be <laughs> i failed first year anthropology so. <laughs> i was gonna say they weren't real enough for you um yeah let's go with that one it was their issue uh yeah i do find that and again like i i do also find this is a part of like me figuring out late in life that i was autistic was like being obsessed with human behavior but not being able to relate to it and that is a huge thing and like my obsession with true crime is like i don't necessarily want to like humanize like bad people but it's just being like i can't believe people can behave this way like and try i don't know like trying to like put the puzzle pieces together just for something that totally makes sense and like I mean, obviously, the autism and neurodivergent community as a whole is not a monolith. But like, have you found, have you found that that's a common thread with a lot of other people, like who who uh, identifies on the spectrum? Yeah, yeah. Not to get too far into this, but like, um, no, no, no. Uh, so, uh, usually they say how like young boys are obsessed with like trains and um, trucks and stuff. That that's usually this is like such a simplification of it. But how autism um, shows in AFAB people, people assigned female at birth, um, mm-hmm. is that they are like more into true crime and stuff like that, and celebrities. Which I was like, okay, shade. I was like, <laughs> but um, that they are into psychology and human behavior and true crime and stuff a little bit more. Huh. It's weird. This is also the tiniest rant for like a thing where most people who are autistic they are trans or non-binary um all the research is very binary based of course yeah, there you go. but anyways true crime i mean that is true a true crime, crime rate in itself segue <laughs> oh segue guess what this is societal one. intervention <laughs> we watched both I... one time and <laughs> <laughs> i feel like we are definitely going to be the hosts that have to constantly remind each other that this is a visual or not a visual medium. A hundred percent. But we're two English majors, so we're good with the talking. Mm-hmm. The talking we do a well. <laughs> I like it. Thank you. Um, so would you like to go first? Yeah, because I very rudely claimed it before we started recording. I'm very excited because I, I was getting again like just putting way too much thought into it, and I was like, "What oh, do you want to decide?" Like pre-recording, yeah. Or like, and I was in the middle of like coming up with that thought, and you were like, "I'll go first. I could I see like, it, and oh, I was yeah. like, "We have put this off, and we just need to do it's it." It's true, and I'm so excited to tell you this story. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, I'm so excited um, to hear. So I don't want to give too much away, but but the things I will say are astronaut road trip diapers oh my god do you know i know the 
I know the baseline story, but I do not know all the details. So, so that I'm was me too. Sure. I had like okay. all I, that's what I thought. I actually thought that she had kidnapped someone and made them wear diapers. Like I had clearly no idea what, what the hell this story was. Um, but then I was listening to another podcast, uh, Let's Go to Court, and they okay. talked about this and I was like, holy hell, this is insane. So I'm going to be talking today about Lisa Nowak. Okay. Diaper wearer. Astronaut. Extraordinary. Yeah, extraordinary. She wore it an extraordinary way. <laughs> not, not enough people talk about how she wore the diaper. <laughs> yeah, she wore him real stylishly. So uh, Lisa Nowak was born Lisa Caputo on May 10th, 1963. Fun fact, that makes her a Taurus. Ooh. Uh, I know nothing about astrological signs except for mine is the most disappointing one. What are you? Capricorn. I, as soon as you said the most disappointing, I didn't want to say. So clearly you're a Capricorn, but. Definitely. I'm a, such a fish goat. <laughs> That's actually, I can really see you being a Capricorn. Anyways, Lisa Caputo. Uh, she, Caputo. <laughs> she's born in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was the first of three girls. Her father was a computer consultant and her mother a biologist specialist. So real dummies. Okay. Yeah. The dumbest in the lot. Get on my level. <laughs> I failed first year anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, in 1969, at the age of six, Le- uh, Lisa watches the Apollo 11 moon mission, watching Neil Armstrong strut across that soundstage. I mean moon. Oh, boo. Uh, boo. <laughs> <laughs> what is reality? Uh, and her interest in space booms. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I saw that. Yeah. I'm, I'm funny. So growing up, Lisa, she's following the news on the space shuttle program. She's inspired and influenced by the announcement of NASA's Astronaut Group 8, which is a program of 35 astronauts, which was the largest to date at the time. And it was the first program that wasn't entirely made up of exclusively cis white men. So they were boasting that, like, you know, we're inviting the ladies. We're inviting the visual minorities. And a list. Wait, was this? Sorry to I. I, please, I don't please. want to derail you. Derail. Was this the group? Oh God. Was this? This was before like the Challenger missions and everything like that, right? Like this was. I, I don't remember the year that the Challenger, thing. It was, eighties. Okay, then yes. Okay. Okay. If we're confirming that. Gotcha. Facts stayed, but don't quote me on that part. So, okay. um, okay, but this is the hilarious part. So they're like, you know, we're inviting women. Six out of the 35 were women. What else do you want? Feminism. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone. You have to count that on two hands, bitches. <laughs> you really, you're, you're still complaining? Uh, and growing up, she was also a frequent patron of the Air and Space Museum, which is in Washington, Okay. Which my that sounds super. Fun my brother went and really liked it, so okay. there's a little boast for it. So uh, the Caputos clearly come from privilege and are high achievers. Lisa, no different. In the like Rory versus Paris duo on Gilmore Girls, I see her as more of a Paris Geller. Yeah. If you catch okay. my drift. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Wildly smart, a Girl Scout. She was actually a member of the French Honor Society, which meant she had to maintain an A in French and a B in every other subject. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wrote a, like, anecdote about me not being good at school in another class than that anthropology one, but you guys get the drift. I'm not a great student. <laughs> I was just going to say how I barely squeaked past grade nine applied French. <laughs> so, um, she was on the math team, just like Mean Girls. She was on student council. She played field hockey, participated in field and track. She was uh, named student athlete of the year, which was given to the student who excelled in sports and classes. I'm guessing she peaked in high school. Uh, And she... (laughs) I know what happens at the end of the story. Yeah, that's true. The peak has yet to come. I said diapers at the beginning of this, so... Um, (laughs) 
and she ends up graduating high school as co-valedictorian. Uh, oh. Which, when I read this to my partner Cameron, he said, just like Rory in Paris. So, Oh my god. So the, right. the similarities continue. Okay. So she's accepted into Brown, uh, as well as the United States Naval Academy in Anna- Annapolis. I was dreading having to say that. Annapolis. You gotta get on top of it. <laughs> So I think that that means she's technically just joining the Navy and then going off to like the training part. But I know nothing about the Navy, but that's what I think is happening. But anyways, she's invited into the Naval Academy and into Brown. Okay. Her family wants her to go to Brown, um, but like she has this goal of going into space. And so she thinks like, you know what, that's going to be my more streamlined way of getting there. So she ends up joining this Naval Academy um, so the year she joins it is 1981, which is okay. throwing... Oh, no, no. I was going to say that throws off my Challenger thing, but no, it doesn't. No, no. You're, you're good. Yep. So new girl on campus. Speaking of girls on campus, the Academy had just started accepting women to the school a cool five years earlier in 1976. Five years? Yeah. Well, that was like the fact I learned recently. But it was like in the 70s. Like, it wasn't until the 70s that a woman in the States could get her own credit card without her husband signing up for it for her. Oh, my God. Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's an episode of Mad Men where they come up with a bank account for men that's private so their wives don't see it. So, America's <laughs> doing great. Still doing great. They're They've still worked knocking, it all out. You know what? So good. She's knocking it out of the park. No notes. No notes. <laughs> Perfect 10. Um, so... Yeah, obviously, like, women being on campus is a new thing. And I'm bringing this up, too, to to point out that, like, she had this goal to be in this field, and she didn't have a ton of female role models. Like, she was those role models for people before. That's a lot of pressure. Right, yeah, that's, like, very, like, that's hard definition of a trailblazer. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. And so she's here, like, you know, um, at the Naval Academy, and it's, apparently really not uncommon to hear professors say they don't think women belonged um harassment of female students incredibly common with zero consequences that's weird i just can't i can't fathom (laughs) what living in a world like that is like (laughs) uh but lisa like she does not let this stop her as we've seen she is a high achiever she is participating on the track team at the naval academy she keeps up being an amazing student and in 1985, she graduates with a bachelor in science degree in aeronautical engineering. Oh, my God. That's so many more syllables than my degree. I failed first year of the spell sheet. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but if you put all those syllables together, you're right up there, with Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> my general English degree. So, um... So she graduates, she starts her career with the Navy, uh, which ends up relocating her to Houston, Texas, okay. home of Beyonce. She did combat training, uh, but at this time in, in 1985, mind you, it was still against the law for women to participate in combat. Against the law. The law for their safety. So they're being trained in this, like, to do this job that they aren't even technically allowed to do, even if they're excelling at the training, like they're not allowed to go help. And so getting in is like a huge deal, extra big deal. If you're a woman, Lisa gets in. Um, obviously it's very controversial as well. Cause men are like, why am I being passed over for a woman who can't even do it? Of course. Um, and she ends up, um, she does that and she completes her training and continues to, <laughs> The, electron- the Electronic Warfare School in California. That sounds made up. <laughs> the Electronic Warfare School. Mm-hmm. In Cal- yeah, I don't know why the in California part sounded made up to me, but no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in 1988, Lisa marries a former classmate of hers from the Naval Academy, Richard Nowak, becoming Lisa Nowak. The two get married at the Naval Academy Chapel. In 1990, she goes back to school and gets herself a master's and another degree, graduating in 92. Oh, my God. Yeah, which is the okay. same year her and her husband have their first kid. So Holy she did part of that pregnant. Shit. This is 
Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I'm very impressed. I like like the the diaper doesn't bring this down. <laughs> Just wait. Just wait for the diaper. It depends how messy it is and how many were used. That's fair. Um. So you said that they that her and her husband were at the Naval Academy together. Mm-hmm. Is there like what? Do we know what their relationship was like? Like, was he supportive of her? Just wait. Oh, okay. Um, we we will get into the the ins and outs of their relationship. I don't know if you heard me say love triangle at the beginning. So, oh my god, I did not. I miss love triangle. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, here we go. Uh, so after graduate school, she's invited to participate in the United States Naval Test Pilot School. There's a bunch okay. more, but like basically, she's killing it in the Navy. Right. Lisa plus Navy equals smiley face. To just really <laughs> put that in layman's terms. That's in her uh, official military record. It's absolutely. <laughs> no, one page. Lisa plus mil- Navy equals smiley. I don't page. know what to tell Not you, man. She's like a little <laughs> It's just like a business card. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, so that brings us to June 95, and NASA is announcing that they're looking for new candidates. Okay. So Lisa is one of 2,400 people to apply. And just like a little fact is that because of like her position in the military, she couldn't apply like a civilian would. She had to submit her application to a review board who would have to approve it and then send it on to NASA. So to get into the program which like obviously she does she had to be approved by this board too so like whoa it's a lot of work like i'm just like tired and i only had to write this down yeah i was like putting off sitting down to talk to you (laughs) a great friend (laughs) about stuff that i am excited to both learn and tell you and oh my god in that time she's she's blazed trails Jesus. Um, oh, I was only five at this time. So. In 95? Oh, is it okay. still 1995? Yeah, 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 yes. still 95. You're good to okay. go. Um, so she applies in 95. They find out in 96 that she's been accepted along with 150 other people. But oh. here's, the, here's the other thing. That's 150 people who are invited to come, like, try out. Okay, so this is, like, the first pool. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it's still like out of twenty four hundred people. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Wild to even be in that one fifty. Yeah. So she's asked to report to the Johnson Space Center for a week, and there they do interviews, medical evaluations, and orientation. Uh, which I like to think was a lot like my own orientation, which was rather humiliating, and we had to dance on a football field in front of people. That sounds great. You know that I love. Actually organized participation and dancing in front of strangers Uh, forced socialization please is my top three favorite Mm -hmm. i made no friends that day so uh may 1st 96 this is like almost an entire year after they announced that they're even looking for candidates they announced the name of their 10 new pilots and 24 new mission specialists which includes lisa as a mission specialist as mission specialist okay Mm -hmm. So just a little interesting fact about um, this class. It was actually the largest since that 1978 one, which was the same, like that first one to include women. Um, okay. So because there were so many students, this graduating class was nicknamed the Sardines because of how packed in the classroom they were. And they were subsequently like quite a close group of people. Oh, okay. So Lisa and her family, they moved to Texas so she can be closer to work. Um, they build a house and her husband, who is also a naval flight officer, he leaves active duty in 98, but still flies in the reserve. So we're just going to fast forward a teensy little bit to October 2001, which is a mm-hmm. month after 9-11, just, uh, which is important. She's given birth to twins in October. So Lisa and Richard, so now they have the first child and now the twins. So Lisa and her husband, they have this alternating schedule so that, like, someone's always with the kids, but he ends up getting called up because of 9-11, and he has to leave. Um, He gets called up to fly an Operation Enduring Freedom. Good 
God, I can't with the military. Wow. Which leaves Lisa alone with the three kids. Mm-hmm. Um, the twins that she just gave birth to. Yeah. And then what, like a, like a five, like how how old's their first? Ninety two. That's a bit of a. That's like. Okay. That's so they're a big like age what, nine. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a huge age difference, but that's still so much. That's too much. Like, that's too many children. We are childless people. So, <laughs> uh, two thousand two, NASA announces that they have a flight scheduled for November two thousand three. So Lisa's going to, and there Lisa's going to be on it. This is going to be her one and only time in space. Um, she's been, uh, she's going to be the mission specialist with four other astronauts. Okay. So in February of two thousand three, I know I'm throwing a lot of dates at you. The point is to just say February is before she's meant to go. She's still in training, and that's when the Columbia shuttle explodes, which kills all seven astronauts oh. on board. Yes. Several of whom Lisa knew, who were in her class, the sardines. Oh my god! Like in her, in the sardines. Yeah. Oh my god! Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, including her best friend Laurel Clark. Yeah. So I was a little confused about this part. I don't know if it was common practice or not, but I read that Lisa was like incredibly involved in supporting Laurel's family after her death, and like helping with paperwork and stuff like that. Uh, right. But I I I have heard that i think like maybe it's like an, a cultural thing among the astronaut community mm, like an unspoken but not like an official thing yeah like it's yeah because they all know I, I i don't know why i have that association though so yeah. i'm not sure this disaster it's like it obviously obviously shook lisa i can speak uh in one article she talks about watching it happen on tv no like with her oh my son God. Oh boy. And she uh. says that he holds her hand and looks up at her and says, Mom, I still want you to go. Whoa. I can't. So after uh, the Columbia shuttle exploded, it caused NASA to shuffle a bunch of their flights around, looking at different equipment, checking safety protocols, all this stuff. So right. schedules, they get bumped. And just how it worked out, Lisa's flight was scheduled, it was rescheduled for 2004. And it's going to be the second flight since that explosion that killed four of her friends. Oh my God, no pressure. Yeah. Uh, so early 2004, Lisa is sent off to Canada for training before her flight. Uh, she trains with other astronauts that are going into space but aren't necessarily on her flight. And there she reconnects with an old classmate, William Opheline, who often goes by the nickname Billy O. <laughs> all right yeah. i'm gonna for some reason i i wanted to like jump in with a nickname and all i could think of was willie ofi willie ofi would no that's worse neither are it's great. much worse than billy o. neither are great but i definitely i i brought billy o down a little bit you yeah i'm it's a it's <laughs> But Ophelin, anyways, I'm going to be just referring to him as good old Bill going forth. So don't get confused, people. So who's Bill? Billy O, let's meet him. He was born March 29th, 1965, making him an Aries. Excellent. He's born in Virginia. I assume. <laughs> you, you assume. He was born in Virginia, uh, but he grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, so okay. growing up, he flew float planes. <laughs> this is my sentence that I wrote down. Growing up, he flew float plane, planes. Graduated high school. There wasn't a lot of detail on Billy. Uh, so <laughs> he goes off to get a bachelor degree, or a bachelor of science degree in electrical mm-hmm. engineering from Oregon State, where obviously he was on a frat. Ooh. He graduates in 88 and immediately joins the Navy. He was going... He's doing well on this career path. He was a top gun pilot. So he, he obviously saw the new movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And 10. Now I'm picturing him as Miles Teller. Please. I just always picture Miles Teller. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, and 10 years after originally graduating, he goes back to school and gets a master's at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. In 98, he's selected to train at NASA. And two years later, he receives his astronaut pin. 
Oh. Um, he was initially assigned to technical details, but he eventually would be chosen to pilot and do a one and only flight in space, just like Lisa. Right. And it was the training for this that led him uh, to that uh, training in Canada. The two meet up and uh, things get a little spicy. Oh. And the two start an affair. Okay. So career-wise, Bill's doing A-okay. In his personal life, he sounds like a bit of a creep in my opinion. But he is a victim. <laughs> I need to remind myself, but <laughs> okay. creep's going to creep. Okay. So when he and Lisa are hooking up astronaut style, they're both married to other people and have children. <laughs> okay. They've got, that's, that's the astronaut style. <laughs> <laughs> you have to Not you think it's about weightlessness or space or anything? You you have to be married, and oh my god, you need children. you need, and then you start an affair. I don't mean to be yeah. smirch astronauts. Uh, oh. So in two thousand five, Bill's wife of nineteen years finds out about the cheating, and the two divorce. Okay. Um, Lisa's still with her husband, and they continue this affair until two thousand six, where I read one thing. I read said that Bill said that it quote fizzled out. I I have heard that before. <laughs> I'm not really sure if Lisa was aware it had fizzled out. I was not in the times that I had been told it was fizzling. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely a red flag phrase coming from a straight man. Like, yeah, I just like, it just wasn't there anymore, you know? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but you you actively painted them a very vivid mental image and then just stopped oh yeah communicating with them in any way uh and you know what was there it was colleen shipman <laughs> that is what <laughs> that's what uh got there that made him less excited so oh gotcha. so bill meets colleen shipman in november 2006 at a training event in florida unrelated to astronomics or whatever the hell you call it no, astronomics is I believe that's it. I believe term. that is the scientific term. So the two start dating. Uh, Colleen lives in Florida. Bill's in Texas. And overlap or not, he tells Lisa... Oh, sorry. I meant to say that I did read an article that said that there was a bit of a relationship overlap. Just a little bit of a relationship. It was a teensy bit. Uh, oh, like when Billy, it was fizzling. Oh, would never. I don't think would he would. It must have been in the that. fizzle period. Yeah, you know when the your pop's going had flat? definitely started. Mm -hmm. It was just like sputtering. Yeah, and then we went into full fizzle fuddle, and he tells mm -hmm. her, "I'm seeing Colleen. I just want to see Colleen." And he ends things with Lisa. Apparently, according to Bill, Lisa takes it well. Actually, according to other people too, a lot of people thought she was fine. Um. So yeah, Bill says. Things are going well. Split was amicable. He thought everything was okay because they were still talking on the phone pretty much every day. They were training for this bike race they were going to do together. They continued doing that. And apparently Lisa even stored her bike at Bill's house. And so okay. on one of her visits, Colleen sees this bike and says, when do you ride a purple bike? And Bill goes, I don't. It's Lisa's. And it's like, okay, who the fuck is Lisa? Mm -hmm. So then it comes mm -hmm. out that Bill has given Lisa a key to his apartment. Um, she has passwords to his email. They're very close. Colleen's like clearly a little freaked out, tells him she's worried that, you know, I don't think you're ready to leave this, to cut ties with this other girlfriend. He tries to smooth things over. They go out that night and get drunk. And then later when they're hooking up, my dude calls her lisa in bed no oh <laughs> billy oh <laughs> come on man okay oh, God. all right yeah boner killer so poor colleen oh so it's november 2006 colleen and bill are dating um that's when they started dating he eventually tells lisa okay. you know colleen's my one and only and that brings us to 2007 Lisa has separated from her husband. Okay. Lisa being the, the first girlfriend of, of Billy O. Um, it seemed that, like, she had left 
him, like Richard thinking like this will leave way for me and Bill to be together. Oh, okay. But, like not really how Bill's feeling because like I don't know if you heard Lisa, but the word on the street is things have fizzled. Yeah, things are gone. I know you talk every day and you share bank accounts and probably illegitimate children and stuff. <laughs> but like, it's just there's not his. <laughs> yeah, move on. Um. <laughs> No, not really move on. He was he was probably a jerk. So he's still seen Colleen. So Bill says things seem good. Lisa and him are buds. And she'd even wished him, like, have a good visit, knowing that Colleen was flying in from Florida to visit Bill for the weekend. So she's coming across as, like, very, like, yeah, yeah, you're seeing someone else. It's fine. Yeah. But Lisa wasn't really handling the breakup as well as she was playing off. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lisa was upset. Uh-huh. Uh, in a letter found in Lisa's vehicle at the end of all this. Oh my she... god, found letters. Yeah. This is my <laughs> okay, okay. Um, she had written a letter to Bill's mom where she said, quote, Bill is absolutely the best person I've ever known and I love him more than I knew possible. Fortunately, that past situation is finally coming to a close with formal separation and separate living arrangements accomplished, and I am in the process of completing all the official divorce paperwork. It is long overdue, but it is finally here, and I am very much looking forward to getting to know you even better. Meaning, Bill's mom. Yeah. So, clearly she thinks... Things are going in a different direction. She's, like, ended her marriage. She's settled her living arrangements. She's ready to start this new life with Bill. And Lisa was not going to let Bill go without a fight. Or, at the very least, a conversation with this, quote, other woman. Gotcha. So Lisa formulated a plan. So Colleen Shipman, she's heading back to Florida after visiting Bill, her boyfriend of three months. Despite her fears and this, like, wrong name fiasco, she's really happy and in love. In the early hours of February 5th, 2007, she lands and she goes to get her luggage. But there's this delay and the passengers end up having to wait over an hour for their luggage to finally come through the carousel. Okay. With her bag finally in her hand, Colleen goes to find a shuttle that's going to bring her to the parking lot. At this point, she finally notices a woman dressed in a trench coat and a wig with a hood pulled up over it who seems to be going in the same direction as Colleen. And she thinks she remembers seeing the woman at the carousel as well. Odd, but I mean, there are a lot of people around and surely other people are parked in the same area as Colleen. Mm -hmm. As she leaves the shuttle, the strange looking woman starts following her and starts to pick up speed. Colleen is obviously panicked and hurries Mm -hmm. towards her car colleen hears the woman pick up speed behind her she talks about hearing the swishing of her pants and colleen gets to the safety of her car just in time okay the woman starts knocking on the window asking for help begging for a ride saying her boyfriend was meant to pick her up he didn't arrive it's really late she's been traveling for a long time um can you help me can you drive me to the parking attendant colleen is like yo, I'm not letting you in my car. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're coming on a little strong. Mm-hmm. But I'll go drive to the parking attendant and get you help. That okay. was not okay. good for this woman. She's like, let me use your phone. The woman, Colleen's like, my phone's not working. Whether that's a lie yeah. or not. The woman is just like not stopping. So finally Colleen rolls down her window like just a crack to like start to talk to this lady a little bit more clear. But before mm-hmm. the conversation can like even continue colleen can't see there is searing pain and her eyes are burning the woman has sprayed pepper spray into the car gasping for air unsure of what is going on colleen drives away to the parking booth in the in this parking lot and they call the police later colleen would say she blasted me with 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 what felt like acid i stomped on the gas and wondered if there was a gun pointed at my head Oh my god, that's horrifying. It's so scary. And also this is at like 5 in the morning. Like you just flew, Mm -hmm. like your luggage is delayed. You also saw this creepy person in the luggage thing for over an hour and then they follow you and 
Yeah. So the police arrive and they arrest this mysterious woman. Colleen said that when she was in the airport police station right after this altercation, they start asking her, are you an astronaut? She says no. She thinks that's a pretty weird question, but she says my boyfriend is. After they ask her if the name Lisa Nowak means anything to her, Colleen's first assumption is that her attacker stole Lisa's credentials uh, that the police had in their possession. Because, like, how could Colleen do this? She lives in Texas, she thought. Finally, Mm -hmm. they call Bill at home and they have him confirm the name of his ex. The attacker was Lisa Nowak. Lisa said that when she heard that Colleen was flying back from her visit with Bill, she decided to drive to meet Colleen when she landed so that they could, quote, talk. Sounds like it, yeah. That's how I talk to people. Through a window with pepper spray. I am always equipped with pepper spray. (laughs) (laughs) That is not true. Um, (laughs) But in addition... Oh, yeah, so she wants to talk. So in addition to her, like, weird disguise, they find this bag. And it contains a lot of fun things. Oh, man. It has the letters that I talked about earlier. Mm Mm-hmm. It has several weapons, such as a BB pistol and ammunition, a steel mallet, a folding knife, latex gloves, and garbage bags. Woof. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's, uh... Yeah. Wow. To talk. She also had emails between Colleen and Bill that she had obviously got through her, like, very open access to his email... Right, right. Like, it's not like she's being a hacker. No. Like, she just has access. He's like, yeah. here's my password. It's 1234astronaut69 or something. <laughs> uh, so one thing I read was that uh, she had Colleen's flight info on a piece of paper that was in Colleen's writing, meaning she'd been in Bill's house. Oh, there were okay. unidentified pills, money, and other currency. And the one detail that stuck in the media more than anything... Lisa told authorities that she'd opted to wear diapers on the trip to avoid having to stop. That way she could ensure she would make it on time to meet Colleen for this chat. Holy hell. So a few days after the incident, Lisa appears in court. Two fellow astronauts fly in from Florida to support her, saying that they were really worried about her mental well-being. I don't know why, though. No, that's weird. Uh, Get your assumptions out of my space. (laughs) The state said that with all of the stuff found in her bag, it was clear her intentions were to kidnap or seriously injure Colleen. Her defense said, one's good work must count for something. Does, I, what? What is that? Your Honor, I believe you'll find that my client is good at math. <laughs> She's good sometimes at other things. <laughs> sure, if we're talking about this stuff... <laughs> Not great. She has other strengths. She she hasn't tried <laughs> Terry, to... do you know what I'm people. not allowed to talk about? <laughs> so many babies. <laughs> so many children. So much training. Hockey. Oh, my God. Hockey? The Honor French Club. Oh, hockey. right. Her hockey. <laughs> field hockey. I was like, what? I understand now. She was in field hockey. She deserves bail. So, yes. um... Yeah, her calling or her calling. Her defense lawyer says this, pointing out, you know, she's never been in trouble before, trying to say it's a lapse of judgment. Uh, the judge originally was going to release Lisa on bail with an ankle monitor, but before that could happen, Orlando police charged her with attempted first degree murder, and announced that, that she would not be released on bail. Whoa. Her lawyer, uh, pissed alleges that police and prosecutors unhappy that Noek had been granted bail pressed more serious charges solely in an attempt to keep her in jail. But if that... I'm glad that's never happened with the police. No, there... Before or after they kind of cleaned up their... Absolutely. Uh, But if that was their goal, it didn't work out because she was arraigned for a second time and her new charges were applied and the judge just like ups her bail and she still posts it and is released from jail. God, was it the same judge, too? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of people are were really shocked by this behavior in Lisa, not realizing that she'd been harboring these deep feelings for Bill still. Right. During her trial, she wanted to go with an insanity plea, 
Uh, but NASA obviously yeah. had some issues with this, being like, whoa, 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 whoa. We only hire the sharpest, the sanest, the best. We test people <laughs> one time when they start with us. Everything after that, not our fault. <laughs> so some people believe that the Columbia shuttle explosion really affected Lisa. as She had known so many of the people that had been lost in the incident. Obviously, it really affected her. I don't mean to say that, that right. like, that's shocking. It, it affected her. But people are trying to say, could this have contributed to her state of mind? Right, right. Or like the... The, the distraught. Not, like instigator. But yeah, yeah. like that, that amount of stress that's so close to you in a myriad of different ways absolutely and like Like, yeah clearly she's been like wound tight forever and this like terrifying thing happens she loses classmates she loses close friends um some people are suggesting that uh after coming back to earth from her like one and only mission was really hard i read that that is really hard on a lot of people Uh, Mm -hmm. None of this is to justify her actions. It's just to point out there's a lot of trauma that can happen after your, like, single psych evaluation, NASA. uh, And they're not... Just a little bit. And they're not keeping up on it. Mm -hmm. And also, if Lisa's starting to feel these things, it's not like she's going to want to speak up and potentially lose her trip to space. This has been a lifelong goal. 100%. You're already coming at it from the, the perspective of everybody thinks that i don't belong here being like, a woman ex- yes being told yeah, all the time and like of course like you do you want to be the first woman in this program to come out and just be like yeah my i'm really emotional right now like yeah. it's just such an like that's such a difficult situation exactly to, to and I, and i don't think a lot of people would want to speak up especially going to space like for people to do that, it sounded like a lot of them were getting like a one and only trip. And so if this is what you're training for. Yeah. Which I, I had no idea that like, it just, I mean, it's great, obviously, for the people that get to do it. But I did not think that NASA was the kind of organization who would invest so much well, they do time and effort things. and training. They do? <laughs> yeah, like they do other things than like... <laughs> Like, there's a lot of things that they'll do for NASA, but then it's like, okay, now it's just, like, your one, like, your job for the next, like, year or whatever, like, the project you're going to work on is one that's going to send you to space. Fair enough. That now, I don't sense. know if I everyone you're gonna is going to be like, they have their own cheese. Their own cheese? When you were like, they do other stuff. Oh, yeah. They ferment cheese. Um, they're getting into wine grapes I'm really into craft beer and moustache oh, yeah and collaging surprisingly mm. enough yeah threw that right in the yeah end. they're just like you know arts and crafts um <clears throat> so she ends up she takes an evaluation for this insanity plea she's found capable of standing trial and her lawyer eventually withdraws the insanity defense right right they're not like, notoriously difficult to Incredibly, i don't know whether anywhere else yeah. but like in the states it is ridiculous yeah to try to successfully argue the insanity plans yeah and i think also her position it's like it's so much harder she was actually the the first and i think maybe only at this point like active nasa employee to be charged with something like this is whoa yeah like it's yeah so anyways In 2009, she takes a plea deal and she pleads guilty to a reduced charge of burglary and misdemeanor battery. So not attempted murder. Mm -hmm. Um, So during the court hearing, she said she was sincerely sorry for her actions and she promised that she would never contact Bill again. She was given time served and probation. (laughs) Uh, So no jail time. In 2010, she received, quote, an I've never heard this before. Other than honorable discharge from the Navy. Other than honorable yeah, discharge. Yeah, I thought that they just called it un... Dishonorable? Unhonorable. Right? Like, oh my god. In- uh, dishonorable, in honor. I know words. Not very honorific. No, so booted. You talked about diapers on TV. How That's a you? trade secret. <laughs> So where is everyone now? So Lisa and Richard, they secured that divorce uh, and she got custody of the kids, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Bill and Colleen, what do you think happened to them? I am going to say this event just brought those two handsome kittens closer together. It sure did. They got married yes. to each other. Beautiful. They live in Alaska with their son. Uh, they have an mm. adventure writing website. What? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Colleen, um, she's not really talked a lot about this, but I did see she there was like like an anniversary or you know kind mm-hmm. of thing around it, and she she spoke out. She said that uh, she still struggles to ever feel comfortable or safe, which is quite understandable. She says oh, that yeah. she is constantly armed, America. Oh. Um, she said in one report that after the attack, she thought, I'm going to be okay from this. But she said that it was never okay after that, which is so oh sad. God. That's so sad. Lisa reportedly lives in Houston still. She works in the private sector and is trying to put this lapse in judgment behind her. And after this case, NASA implemented ongoing psych evaluations. Good, good job, NASA. Way to go. And that is the story wow. of Lisa Nowak. Oh my god. That is so different than I had in my mind. Yeah. Like, the narrative in my head that I was like, oh yeah, like, no question. Like, she crossed country and kidnapped him. Mm-hmm. She did cross country. Like, she went from yeah, Houston but it was to like Florida, only... which is pretty far. That's true. That is a long drive. But yeah, I Hence yeah, the that diapers. was so so different than anything that I had assumed was correct. Yeah. What do you think about no jail time? Or I guess time served, she I guess. I mean, it's tough to say and like I often have these conversations about jail time because like I do agree with abolition. Like I just I and it's that it's that tough call right like you can't i've seen so many people just like oh thank god for the cops and the fbi now they've raided trump Mm -hmm. and it's like okay you can't be for it in one instance and not all instances like you're you're just saying so something that's convenient to you like i do i guess like in certain extreme circumstances like maybe keeping someone separate from the group is a better choice like safety wise but at the same time like what is that really going to do like we we already know that jail doesn't work and i think in her case like this is not really the behavior of someone who you would say is like in their right frame of mind and it's like so what is jail gonna do to someone when like she needs to talk to a therapist like she needs exact support yeah yeah and like what you're gonna up. so you're gonna she's feeling isolated and making all of these bad choices yeah so you're going to isolate her until she's better like it, yeah. it, it, it that doesn't make any it sense just makes to me, me think of all. the like scary version of the naughty chair from uh that like nanny yes. rescue show that it's mm-hmm. like okay well you've been mm-hmm. bad like go to the corner but like what is it like it just make i don't know it's silly so it's just like in my mind it's like it's far more of a reflection on the group that these stories come out of like if you are supportive of prison in all these cases in any case really like to me it just means that like then you don't really and this is not an overall judgment on people because a lot of these decisions and conversations are very very difficult to have yeah i think that's important too you don't want to have that you don't want to have that conversation kind of thing like it's much easier to put someone away and close the door and pretend that you've done the right thing and everyone's better for it than to actually grapple with like well what is it about this that that kind of conspired to make this mm-hmm. situation what it was force her to use a toilet no more diapers for you lisa no you're gonna shit in a toilet she was... surrounded by women <laughs> this is your punishment first first piece of merch <laughs> that phrase is going on a t-shirt the whole it's kind of long what part are we going with 
shitting on a toilet. Um, you're, we're gonna start it so it looks like we're gonna start it in a really big font so it looks like we got scared like closer to the bottom. We're like, I'll oh, make it smaller to make it fit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be this great. Was perfect. Um, well, that was uh, an amazing story. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I was really excited. I'm not gonna lie. I switched my story like three times because I would just wanted to give you something really good at the beginning. That was I good. To come in that was hot. great. Yes. Yeah. No, that was super, super good. I'm really, I'm shocked at how little I actually I know, it's wild. So my story takes place in quite the distant past. Okay. Um, and I know I mentioned this to see, to just to make sure that yes. they weren't overlapping or anything. But I'm hoping you didn't look anything I up didn't. about it. I didn't. I already forget the person's okay. name. This okay. is the beauty of okay. smoking as much weed as I do. I don't remember the name. <laughs> At the time, it was all gone. I was like, it sounds familiar. And Cam said I would yes. look it up. And I was like, why would I do that? I've never, I'm not, I'm not one yeah, to ruin the fine. surprise. Woo. Okay. Do you recognize the name Martin Gare? How do you spell Gare? G-U-E-R-R-E. And it's pronounced Gare? I believe so. This could be, this is full of like, it's not just like France. I was going to say, that sounds like Gare. But like the border of, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So we're in France. It might be Gare. In France. I, I'm very, I don't know if you know I'm cultural. I pronounce it as France. <laughs> Do you also say Bartholomew? And Abitha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I oh. already forget his first name. Starts with an M. Martin, Martin Gruyere, like the cheese. Martin Gruyere. Is it cheese? Uh, man, that's a delicious okay i doubted it was cheese for a minute no you got it yours it was very good uh so this is way back in 1500 oh okay yeah this is so long ago so um in 1538 there's a man named martin gare and he marries a woman i say woman she's a girl at the time they're both children really it's the middle ages Mm what have you or the medieval ages like an old so sumi historians yes <laughs> pretty much i think he may have been about 14 oh God. yes he was before 14 so yeah. old but so yeah she was by her own account nine or ten years old what was the and name of his time? With martin yeah. martin gare gruyere martin, martin. <laughs> well, how old is he <laughs> Uh, he was about fourteen, and she's nine or ten. Yes, got it. By her own they must account, have so, so there's historians much to talk that about. like, oh yeah, there's like the most. Like, Did you watch the Weekenders? Every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what teens do still, right? Teens. Yeah, they gotta find crevasses. Yes, chum bucket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they are in the small village of Rolls in Ar- or no, sorry, the small village of Artigat. In, it's like a small, small from? village of free peasants. In so they don't like, they're they don't have any fealty to like a lord or anything like that. Like they they work the land, but like essentially they're not indentured servants, and they're really like proud of that identity. Okay, there's like a little bit of a mix in the Basque culture um, coming up from Spain. There's a whole bunch of wars and migration happening at the time. So it's. It's a mixed group. They speak a couple different languages, but this is the area they grew up in. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an arranged marriage. Their families, Kinda they're not assumed. like poor peasants. Yeah, I mean, they didn't just like see each other from across the labor fields. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm nine, almost ten. Do you want to get married? <laughs> I am nine or ten? <laughs> almost ten. Uh, <laughs> so the one of the asides here is that historians think that um, she was probably like closer to 12 or 13 like puberty age because nice. they said that like it like for her to marry that young would have been like blasphemous it would have been considered a no-no by the church but 
there's a lot of stuff the church doesn't yeah, give a shit she about. She just like got so... a period early, and they're like, "You're good to go." Yeah, seriously. Like, I'm gonna go with what the fucking woman said herself. Yeah. Historic. Who says the church? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Truth yeah. Uh, against the Kirk. Oh, wow. I don't. I don't um, recognize you anymore. They had, on top of being children, uh, the weirdest wedding night imaginable. Because it is interrupted by a bunch of village revelers in a community tradition call at the time called the Sharivari. Okay. Translates and to. they basically like come on into the room and like bang pots and pans and make them drink booze and like yell loudly and sing. And like, it's just like ribald. So if they knew this it was going to happen, how is it interrupted? I think it's because like... Maybe as like kids, they hadn't really participated in one themselves. Of just people like these trying to adults. watch you have sex. Yeah, yeah, and that brings me to my first aside, Excellent. which was in this historical period, um, a marriage could be annulled if there was no proof that it was consummated. Ew. Tell so, me how they get proof. Ugh. <laughs> this meant that if a woman accused a husband of impotence. There are literally documented cases of courts observing if the husband could A, oh. get hard, <laughs> and B, have full-on P and V sex wow. in front of a crowd watching to make sure that it was happening. If you can't perform in public, you don't deserve Before a wife. God and everyone, Jesus Christ, put your wee-wee <laughs> Uh, <laughs> your limp dick away <laughs> so the, a lot of people speculate that this is kind of a background for um bertrand and martin because there's no kids for the first 10 years of their okay. marriage um and then eventually there's some like weird little side there's stories no kids that can't besides the two of them Besides the two active yeah. children. Um, but 10 years later, she gets pregnant and she gives birth to their son in 1548. And they name him after Martin's father, Sanxi. No idea if I'm saying that I mean, correctly. S-A-N-X-I. I don't even. Sanxi. Yeah, I was trying to like, like Sanxi. Sanxi <laughs> sounds like a sexy Banksy. It. <laughs> It was all I could think of. Sexy. <laughs> um, so a few months later, Martin apparently stole some of his father's grain. Okay. Um, which sounds like a weird little crime, but it was a big deal at the time. Um, but not for too long, because really, really soon after that, Martin straight up abandons his wife and baby. It's just gone. Even this 15-year-old wasn't a dedicated husband and father? <laughs> Weird. He probably wants right? to go to the this arcade. Ten years later, so he's like twenty-four. <laughs> Please, but he's gone. He is okay. out. His child is like months old, oh. and he just disappears. Super. And no one hears from him for eight solid years. Wow. So fifteen fifty-six rolls around, and Martin Gare returns, and it starts going through the village that Martin Gare's back. Um, he's staying in an inn near the town and he's likely recovering from some kind of illness. Likely story. So, Syphilis. Likely story, yeah. So sick. <laughs> Can't come. <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, his sisters hear about it and go to visit him and then they meet up with him and they're so excited they go and find Bertrand and they bring her to see her long lost husband because at this time, like, there's no divorce. Like, there's no... Mm -hmm legally declaring the person dead and then they come back and it's like well extenuating circumstances like she's just like that's her life okay. now so they bring her to see her lost husband and immediately she accepts him back she spends a few days with him like nursing back his strength and his health oh, okay yeah so it's not gonna be him he returns to the village and any doubt of this person is put to rest after hearing martin regale them like he's telling all these stories and facts that like there's no way that a person who isn't martin would say this he looks like martin he's martin he knows such intimate details oh and 
they were so true that he could not be an imposter. So Bertrand and Martin You're telling me a little live. too hard that he can't be an imposter, which is leading me to some conclusions. I know. But it makes you feel all, all weird. There's, it's, it's so complex. Okay. It's okay. so strange. So Bertrand and Martin continue to live and live really happily by all accounts. They really love each other. Like more this than is they like, did before. Yeah, this goes on for, like, years. It's, like, for a year period of time. They share a fairly good and loving partnership. But, I mean, like, it looks noticeably time. different than before he left, or? Not noticeably different, except for the fact that she does have uh, two more daughters okay. with this. So, like, the time period for having kids has, like, really, They're really clearly down. much more sexually compatible. Obviously, not a bunch of adult men bursting into their house, exactly. hitting I mean, them with that'll... frying pans or whatever. That would be traumatic, right? Like, I cannot imagine how horrifying it would be to like. And then every like, time the after that wedding night sex. thing, like the official, like now it is time for you to retire to the boudoir. And make us like, a I had no thanks. Oh god! And then be like, yeah, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> did it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like for, even for the time, like it seems like a really good and loving partnership. Like they are fairly equal, um, for what's going on. And they have two more daughters, one of whom survived infancy. In late 1558 or early 1559. So he came back in 1556. This was like a solid three years later. Um, Martin gets real mad at his uncle, Pierre, and Pierre in Martin's absence inherited Sanxi, his his brother, Martin's father, inherited Martin's estate, like what would have been his if he'd been around. So sorry, just to clarify this, the mm-hmm. brother inherited the state and the estate instead of the son. Exactly. Um so Martin decides to sue Pierre over this and any profits Pierre had made in the meantime, like since getting the the inheritance and now. Wow. And this seems to really fuel Pierre's anger. Wait, when did Sexy Banksy die? While he was gone. Okay. While okay. Martin was, yeah. Because he was gone for eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, okay. So. Um, Sorry. No, 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 not at all. So it also seems to fuel some public suspicion that this might not be the real Martin. I told you that. So Pierre starts stirring the village pot, and at one point, he ends up with he and other villagers attacking Martin with clubs. Jesus Christ, just like the wedding night. Which is stopped when Bertrand, Mm -hmm. his wife, literally puts herself in between the attackers and Martin to stop them from harming him. Uh, And refused to back down. So they all Mm -hmm. left. 1559 was a pretty tough year. For us all. Uh, In the summer of... Yeah, right? Oh, you remember. remember There was a soldier that was visiting uh, the village. And he delivers some disconcerting news. That Martin Gare is not Martin Gare. Uh, How does he know? Because... He said, Martin is missing a leg lost in a battle. Which is like, okay, he's a soldier, so he would know. But then people are like, would Martin really be in the army? Like, he's trying to say what that kind of life? He lost the leg when he was missing? Yeah. Sus. So people are like, it's, it's there. It's kind of in the air. And like Pierre is full on, like just like whispering in the background. Like, did you hear he's missing a leg? And like all this stuff. Um, Kick his leg. See if it's it... real. <laughs> Does he fall over because it's fake? <laughs> the true test. Science. <laughs> Let's test um, some witches then in the... this. <laughs> Throw him in the river. In the autumn, Martin is accused of arson randomly okay. of burning down a, a, a building in a nearby village mm-hmm. and but the person who accused martin of arson is pretty close friends with pierre got it so people are like okay so these charges already seem trumped mm-hmm. up 
In January 1560, Martin is released from prison, and Pierre immediately has him arrested, this time for assuming the identity of Martin Guerre. Ooh, what did now, you learn? So, oh, so Martin is sent to prison in Rio, and soon after, he's put on trial, and he's actually found guilty mm-hmm. in the first trial. First. He immediately appeals this decision. Mm-hmm. And April 30th, 1560, Martin's appeal begins in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's allowed to face his accusers and defend himself by French law. And he fucking knocks it out of the park. Like, everybody in this court, this guy is so charming. He's so cool. He knows all these details. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, he even states that he will gladly accept any death sentence the court passes down to him if Bertrand, his wife will deny that he is her real husband. And Bertrand dramatically just stays silent. Because they're in, the in on it together. Oh shit. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> so the appeal is like obviously looking very much in Martin's mm-hmm. favor. There's a bunch of clerk documents at the time and the clerks are like, man, this guy's so good that it starts to make me wonder if the people who accused him are faking their identities. <laughs> like, Am I it's like wild. I was? Like, yeah, <laughs> what right do I have to be here? Um, so it's really looking in Martin and Bertrand's favor. Pierre does not look good, and Martin has been consistently delivering like just solid ironclad evidence mm-hmm. that he is who he says he is. And Bertrand and he even give identical accounts of their intimate life prior to him leaving the family and that's exactly when a man with a wooden leg appears in Toulouse and interrupts the trial oh my god so it turns out that right after leaving uh martin serves in the house of a roman catholic cardinal in spain francisco de mendoza and sometime later he serves in the spanish army mm-hmm. And then in 1557, he's wounded while fighting in Flanders, and just as the soldier mentioned in 1559, had a leg amputated. Okay. So Martin, who's on trial, immediately accuses Martin, interrupting the trial, of being a fake. Probably hired by Pierre to discredit him! Oh the man with the wooden leg can't even give details of his married life as well as the man on trial can. <laughs> yeah. However, the court dressed a line of men in the same clothes and had those close to Martin come and identify the man they knew. Mm -hmm. His sisters, his uncle Pierre, and eventually even Bertrand all chose the wooden-legged man who was the real Martin Gare. September 12th, 1560. Um, This man is named Arnaud de Thiel. Mm -hmm. So Arnaud. Arnaud is sentenced to a public apology and death. <laughs> so this is what, who like fake Michael is. Yeah, Martin. this is fake his, Martin. His new name is Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so as a part of the apology, all these things are revealed. The imposter confesses that he is in fact Arnaud de Thiel, a man who <laughs> was something of a gadabout eating, drinking, gambling, and cavorting his way through France. That's awesome. When he served in the army, two soldiers once mistook him for a man that they knew, Martin Guerre. Arnold dug deeper, ending up with a couple of conspirators who gave him all the details of Martin's life. He returned to Artigat and put the plan in place. Okay. So September 16th, 1560... Arnaud is dressed in white. He confesses, and he talks to a few people. Um, He begs that the real Martin not be harsh with Bertrand, and that it was all only and completely him. And Arnaud is hanged in front of Martin Gare's house. I thought no one was going to die! (laughs) I know, I know, but it was, it's, this is what, (laughs) state-sanctioned. It's not, it's not just regular murder. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> died. I know, this is what I wanted to do. The victims died. You broke the rule right away. Yeah. <laughs> the victim didn't die. Okay, so poor <laughs> fake 
Martin. The poor fake Martin. So years later, Martin and Bertrand have two more sons. Arnaud's and Bertrand's daughter is legally considered to be Martin's. Oh, right. As well as able to inherit. Yeah. And and then he she is able to inherit uh, her biological father's money and estate as well when she's of inheriting age. So like wow. the everyone, all of the court documents are basically like this guy wasn't tortured. He wasn't put in prison for a really long time. They didn't drag Bertrand through a court trial because they absolutely could have uh, like tried to get her as a conspiracy and adulteress, which is also punishable yeah. by death. Um, they didn't do any of that. They barely even questioned what the fuck Martin real Martin was doing for eight years. Like they just, everybody was like, this is super weird and embarrassing. And we just, just give the best that we possibly can to all parties. Involved. I have so many questions. Yeah. Bertrand was never questioned. Martin's never punished for his abandonment. And they just live out the rest of their lives together. But as an as, a, as a final aside, um, I was trying to find this exact detail, but it was from memory, that one of the contracts that Bertrand signs when she's really when she's younger but already married to Martin. I think it might be their wedding certificate or something like that, but she just puts like a scribble. It's an ad. like she doesn't she doesn't know what to write. She's mm-hmm. illiterate. Um then in court she's able to sign her name, which means that Arnaud de Til probably took the time to teach Bertrand how to read and write. Yeah as a part of their partnership and specifically in the apology when he said like it was it was nothing to do with her Mm -hmm. it was all me don't do anything to her i honestly feel like they were very much in love like i think i think that she i i really do think that bertrand saw kind like when she first met him kind of saw a way out absolutely like yeah so do you think she knew I think she did. I think she yeah. had to know. I think she had to know. Like, I don't, like, I think the, what a lot of the historical texts we're talking about is the the book that I had read originally that made me always remember this case is called The Return of Martin Gare. And it was written by a historian, but she points out that, like, so much of the inner world of people in the past is lost mm-hmm. to us. It's just gone. Pastos. And so much of that is just like so much of the stuff that remains is almost completely the male perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so she really does try to flesh out these characters in history with like what we can know from just facts in the historical record. But there's also a lot of stuff that she's like, I, I honestly don't know, but her theory is, yeah, like she knew that like she wasn't in a great position from the very beginning. And then meeting this guy who checked off all of the boxes plus a bunch of different ones where he was just a nicer more decent human being yeah. than martin ever was so now she gets to live this life yeah it's a life that she may never have wanted for herself she may never have wanted to just be the peasant wife the peasant mother yeah. but she definitely don't want to be the wife of the man who abandoned and you're just like you're you can't do anything you can't have any close contact you can't have other relationships. Yeah. You, you couldn't have sex for eight years. Like you're you're either hiding it or you're actually abiding by that. And then this guy comes along. He's funny. He's handsome. He's charming. He's by all accounts your Sounds husband. Sounds like he knows how to get down. It's like two kids. Exactly. You're like absolutely yes, one hundred percent. My husband. Yes, I will take him. Thank you. And then like to have that taken away. I bet like the hanging must have fucking sucked. Like, whether... I know. Like, I guess we don't hear her account because, like, maybe she could have said, I had no idea. I feel disgusting. I feel terrified. But, like, we don't know. But, yeah, I don't think she couldn't have known. Because, like, even if someone's face kind of looks similar, like, their whole body's not going to look similar. Their whole body, their demeanor. The fact that he's like, do you want to learn how to read? Because she also probably... Hey, hey, babe, I know I walked out on you and the kids eight years ago, but... I've really been thinking. Because that's the thing. Do you want to learn how to read There has to be gaps. Like, I could so easily 
see him being surprised that she didn't know how to read and write or something and her being like how did you not yes. know that like there could not yeah. be i mean maybe that's a silly one because i'm sure a lot of people couldn't read and write at the time but there had to be some type of slip up there had to be yeah like something and they were saying like it that in the last in the appeal court case when they were both giving the exact same story of their intimate details of life before he, like there's no way yeah, that they didn't that arnold could know that from these random soldiers so the author was like it definitely like, it pretty too. much has to be them like coaching each other and her being like no that's not what happened remember yeah. like this is the thing that happened. And then she just had that to go we back this. with the original one. Like that day must have. Exactly. But yeah, that is the weird story of Martin Gare wow. and Arnold Dettil, who I just, I love the story mainly for like the personal aspects of the story. Like it's a very human story and I'm very into it. I when... need to know so many more things. What was like Arnold's motivation like when you said like he came in like to do his plan like what's his plan just to be like i'm i'm martin yeah like that i hear i have some wife and kids to attend to yeah like so many people have tried to speculate about what his whole thing was and like it was a year two years before he even started looking at money and like the court cases and things like that it was like it didn't even occur to him at the time although <laughs> like, how happy was pierre oh my god he was probably insufferable for the rest of his I life bet, being like, yeah uh, he didn't probably go around too much after that to that house <laughs> yeah that is true that's but, yeah, wild it is just it's such a wild story and it it feels like it honestly feels like a movie plot. It does. Like, it doesn't feel like something that happened in a French court of law in the 1500s. Yeah, it's definitely like a a pretty like out there tale in the twist and turn. And the fact that like they all said the like correct. I keep wanting to call him Michael Martin. Um, <laughs> that's like that kind of sucks. Yes. Yeah, it was. Can you imagine if they, if then like the, the peg legged one, they're like, actually, we figured out that you're not the right one, and we're gonna hang you. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> Kel surprise, <laughs> Kel surprise, front style. Oh. <laughs> wow, yeah, I liked that I, one. Yeah. It's such a, yeah, it's such a weird story. And I hate that there's so many gaps. There's so many gaps. what we know for sure. But I also love that they're there because it just, like, I can just picture them just, like, living life. Like, this guy came into town and was like, yeah, I'm going to assume this person's identity. And then they're like, yeah, he has a wife and a kid. And he was like, cool, I guess I'm a husband and dad now. <laughs> And then just like lived that life, mm-hmm. like they just had like he and would had just more kids, and yeah. they also he had like, to oh, like my. deal with the grief of losing a child together. Yes, like it. There's, there's so much, so much that would have bonded them together more than Bertrand and Martin. Wow, like it's 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 so fascinating. How do you spell Bertrand's name? B e r t r a n d e d e yes that's tough that's a tough name that's a tough well i liked that thank you for that one you are most welcome um well that was i i'm not gonna lie i'm pretty exhausted after those yeah me i'm too. really glad to not i don't know be in crime it's <laughs> <laughs> my takeaway that was a good Thank you. Away. Thank you. I like to learn lessons. Thank you so much for listening to Unscrupulous Podcast. If you want to hear more from us, you can check us out on Instagram at unscrupulouspod. You could always send us an email with any of your case suggestions or just your admiration for us at unscrupulouspod at gmail.com. 
make sure to check out our show notes where you can find information on where we got our resources today and we will check you out next time. Thank you.